Good morning and welcome to the 2019 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Frank Rinaldi and I'm a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel today, Unlocking Potential, the Next Generation of Tracking Data, presented by Stats. Our panelists are Chris Capuano, retired MLB pitcher, current Sloan Fellow, and advisor to Boston Biomotion. Kurt Goldsberry, MBA analyst at ESPN. Rachel Marty Pike, data scientist at NOAA Basketball. And Patrick Lucy, vice president of artificial intelligence at Stats. Our moderator is Shira Springer, sports and society reporter at NPR and WBUR. The panel will run for 45 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you have questions for the panelists, please submit them via Twitter utilizing the hashtag player data. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shira. Okay, I think we are going to start the panel off with a video courtesy of Stats. And you are going to be seeing a, you're getting a look at auto stats. So I think, and, we'll, and while this is playing, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a question to Patrick. Um, let's talk about what, and what we're seeing here, what, what stats can do with artificial intelligence and video from games, and that can, you know, those can be videos from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, you're calling it digitizing the past, but it's also a kind of sports time travel. How does collecting data through video expand the possibilities of tracking data? Yeah, so at Stats, we've actually been collecting tracking data since 1999. So tracking data is not a new thing. It's 20 years old. Um, but tracking data is limited because you have to have a computer vision system in there um, in each venue. And so that really limits the scale. And so that means also you just can't go backwards in time. You're just limited to going forward. So computer vision works really well. You just look at autonomous vehicles. Uh, at Stats, we had sport view system. We collect a lot of data, which has enabled us to basically collect tracking data from any video that you've ever had. So as you said, back in 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, if you have video, we can collect tracking data. Uh, and we can collect really detailed tracking data. So we have data, we have video. Video is kind of cool, but, a, a, but apart from just viewing it, it's not really usable. Using this technology, we can actually digitize it, query it, do analysis. We can compare players over long periods of time. You know, people talk about Jordan, LeBron. Now that's possible. So saying, just can you give us a little bit of an idea of what you're, we're seeing here exactly? Yeah, so basically, so what we have here is body pose tracking, skeleton tracking, and it's a great artificial intelligence um, problem. So as we see this video, we see these basketball players play, right? So we can see their limbs. Previously, we'd just be collecting center of mass, but using computer vision, we're actually able to track the skeletons in every frame. Um, it's a bottom-up approach where we detect each limb uh, each joint, and then we resolve it to a full skeleton. So like how a human sees video, sees humans, a computer can now do that. And that's really, you know, it's really exciting because any video that you have, you can do this now. You can, it's not just the MBA, you can do it for college. And so this week we just launched Autostat, so our goal is to digitize every college game, every game that's ever been played. And so that's the potential of this technology. So I want to move on to Kirk. You've, as, as many people here know, pioneered uh, spatial and visual analytics in basketball, you developed court vision, um, which showed where players took shots from how often and how effective they were for certain, from certain spots on the floor. Um, how has that aspect of tracking data evolved since you first presented a paper here in 2012? Well, <laughs> it's hard to overstate that. And again, apologies for my voice. I blame ESPN for making me go Some to late Bristol. night broadcasting. Late night broadcasting. I wish it was late night something else, but <laughs> it's late night broadcasting in this case. Um, you know, it's been a remarkable decade, this decade, uh, for, for the people on our stage. We've seen so many changes. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a spatial thinker, and I always said when I was first starting at, at the Sloan Conference that Sports are about to have this really powerful spatial and visual awakening within their analytic spaces, and that's definitely happened in the last seven years. Um, you know, space is such a key element of sports strategy and understanding, um, and the, the treatment of spatial data requires visual um, means, visible to understand it, and, and people with cartography backgrounds have known that for a while. 
but I think sports has found it out this decade, and it's pretty incredible, whether it's Second Spectrum or Stats, doing a great job of making our sports uh, more interesting, more, more un uh, providing new avenues to understanding um, everything from now how we're shooting and beyond just the dots on the plane to now arms and limbs uh, and, and three-dimensional spaces has been very remarkable. So Rachel, you're a former college basketball player who's using your analytics knowledge to track shots and also um, expose some of the systematic biases uh, in evaluating shooters. From, from that perspective, uh, what's on the cutting edge for you? Yeah, so just as some background, um, at NOAA basketball, instead of just uh, tracking players in like X and Y coordinates around the court, um, we really focus on the shooter and on the shot. Um, and so we start by tracking uh, who's taking the shot and where they're taking it from. Um, but then we're also tracking the player's pose before, during, and after the shot. Um, and also how the ball's flying through the air, um, which means that if a shot scores, we know um, did it go through the guaranteed make zone? Was it a clean make? Um, or did it rim in? And then if the shot misses, how did it miss? What was that miss mode? Um, was it to the left? Was it to the right? Was it short, long? Um, and so I use uh, a database of about 170 million shots um, with this context um, in order to understand how shooters shoot. Um, and so that's where some of the systematic biases come in. Like we know that players shooting from the right corner are gonna shoot to the left in the hoop and players shooting from the left corner are gonna shoot to the right in the hoop. And the further you go back, the shorter your shot's gonna be in the hoop and things like that. All right, Chris. As a former Major League Baseball player who retired last year, what uh, player tracking data did you use to evaluate or improve your performance? And, and also, what were you looking for as a player? Yeah, so I, as a player, I used uh, a, a lot of video tools. Um, the bat system was really kind of coming into uh, uh, baseball when I was a young player, which uh, really didn't have any analytics to it, but it just finally allowed you to uh, you know, find any pitch that you've ever that was ever thrown over the course of the season. They were all tracked. Um, so I kind of uh, saw the influx of uh, wearables and uh, TrackMan and StatCast, but really didn't incorporate it a lot until my last season when I went and tried uh, something called Driveline, which is uh, um, sort of a new system uh, uh, based in Seattle, Washington, and a guy named Kyle Bodie. Uh, using a lot of these analytics, using a lot of high-speed uh, motion capture, high-speed cameras, to, uh, um, and especially with pitchers, to refine their biomechanics, to look at uh, the way the ball is spinning, different accesses that it's spinning at, uh, to try to maximize the effectiveness uh, in movement of these pitches. And, um, you know, what, once I uh, was out of the game and uh, decided to come back here to Sloan, uh, by the way, just an aside, if you guys see any of the volunteers around here, these are all uh, MIT uh, Sloan students. Like, give them a hug. They've been working for, <laughs> you know, three, several months, each of them, to put together this conference. It's an incredible amount of work that goes into it. So um, I just want to say thank you to all the students. And I also know, like, how stressed out they are because after this, I'll be heading right to the library to start working again to, uh, on stuff for school. So, um, but anyway, as an aside, so I had a couple of injuries in my career and um, a couple of Tommy John injuries. And so I hooked up with a company called Boston Biomotion last year at the conference. And uh, they, they've developed a machine called Proteus, which is another form of player tracking. Uh, it's, a, it's a training device that combines a bunch of machines into one. And while athletes are doing their regular training, uh, it's actually tracking their uh, force production, their power production, their endurance. Um, it knows exactly to sub-millimeter accuracy where, where they're at at all times in space. And um, so what that can do is that can look for trends over time. Uh, and it, it can compare you not only to your baseline, but as we gather more data, uh, it can start to look for norms uh, of where these balances should be in your body. So um, it tracks you over time and then looks for changes. Specifically as a, a pitcher, anecdotally I know that I feel 100% when I start the season and after about a week into the season, especially with baseball, there's 162 games in 183 days. And uh, after about a week or two in, you're sort of in this firefighting mode of just trying to recover. It's all about recover. How do, how do I get ready for that next game, that next outing? And um, specifically, you know, uh, you have to sort of change the way that you train over the course of the season and over the course of a career as, as you get older. Um, so that's the, the, the data that I'm working with is looking to uh, track this muscle and strength performance and looks for trends and changes that might uh, flag injuries before they happen. 
So we've got an, an idea of what the landscape is out there currently. Um, two questions come to mind. First of all, what's sort of the holy gra grail? What's sort of the next big thing or thing you wish you could track? Um, and conversely, what are we tracking now that is perhaps give, is overrated? Gives, you know, is an insight that is just perhaps not useful um, for teams, players, coaches. I throw that out to all of you. Can you, you can answer either side of, of the coin there? Yeah, I'll kick it off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you look at Zion two weeks ago, uh, he blew out his shoe. I think Nike lost 1.5 billion afterwards. So they would like to uh, measure motion and, and actually forces on players' joints. You know, in, in terms of making better product, I think. How close are we to doing something like that? Well, uh, well, we can do it now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I won't advertise. So, if you go to uh, at noon, we have a head of computer vision go into detail how we actually do it. Um, some cool Michael Jordan and some NFL clips there, but basically, you can't improve what you can't measure. And so, I think in baseball, Chris, <clears> great to get your thoughts. You know, uh, when I was in Pittsburgh, we talked to the Pirates. The one baseball solved, but you just can't solve. You have to get the pitcher information, right? You have to get the batter pose. So fine-grained information, getting fingers, you know, that fine, you know, humans sense that, but computers can't do that until now. So for baseball, is that something that you talk about? Is that something that you guys want? Especially if you have an injury, you know, you want to see how you trend over time after the first week, how your pose change, form, all those things is... Yeah. is of, of course, yeah, no doubt. And this is evidenced by the investments that teams are making <coughs> Uh, these sort of mysteriously named things like uh, the hitting lab or the integrative sports performance lab. You know, they, every team now is investing a lot in, uh, you know, bringing on capabilities and data scientists to try to uh, look for that competitive advantage. But you raise a really good point there, lab. A lab's worth it, you know. Yeah. We, you play 162 games, that's a lab. Why yeah. can't you measure that? <clears throat> so I, I think that's the, the mismatch, and I think once we get to be able to measure it in the wild, you call it motion capture in the wild, you know, I think that's what we can do now. Um, because if you look at the combine, you look at the Brady Six, you know, uh, that great ESPN documentary, they say, well, Tom Brady ranked last out of all the quarterbacks, you know, at the combine. And they say, well, that's not what quarterbacking is about. And so I think what we need to do, to your, to your question, Chira, is just measure things that matter within the game. I think we do it in the combine, we do it in the lab, I think that's pointless. I think what you need to really do is do it in the lab and using this technology, computer vision, you don't want to have wearables, um, you know, you're able to do that. Kirk, Rachel, yeah. Yeah, so when we're thinking about shot-centric data, um, the holy grail we really think about is how can we predict if a shot's going to score? Given a particular context, a particular shooter, particular defense, what's the likelihood of that scoring? Um, and if you take a player and you change them from one team to another team, you trade them, how is their shooting percentage going to change? If you bring them from the collegiate level to the professional level, how is that going to change their percentage? And, um, and like you're saying, it's, all of those predictions are going to be dependent on the data we can collect. And so uh, all, every shooting likelihood is based on a whole pie, like a ton of data. And we're kind of getting one slice of it right now. Um, and that slice can account for a ton of the outcome, but there's still so much we're not measuring. Um, like, what's the genetics of a player? Um, what are, uh, what do they eat that day? What are they thinking? We're not measuring any of that. And should we be measuring that? Probably not. But um, it's getting a bigger, bigger, a bigger and bigger piece of that pie so that we can predict those outcomes. Yeah, and for me, the, the holy grail has always been intelligence or understanding. Um, and you have to sort of have a North Star, um, a clean re research question, as the academics in, in here can attest. And as our data sets become increasingly sort of voluminous and complex, it's only more important to have clean research questions and wh what kinds of understanding you want to work towards because there's so much in these data sets right now. You can get lost in them. Um, and the other thing we've seen this decade is just this wild intrusion of all these different ideologies and disciplines into sports analytics. It used to be an endeavor that you could sort of classify as a nerd with Microsoft Excel with some linear regression. And now one, one of the things I think is really one of the big emerging themes, and you're hearing it today, is all the different disciplines are converging into the space. Uh, we have physics, talking about spin rate, and we have um, biomechanics and spatial statistics 
these things weren't sort of synonymous with sports analytics when I first started coming to this conference, <clears throat> and they certainly are now. In fact, they're the bread and butter, um, in, in, at least in the pro sports level. So how can you build these sort of interdisciplinary intelligence agencies that target the right questions and produce the right insights for their organizations? So it's interesting, Kirk, you mentioned all the different disciplines that are converging into this space. And I think it's interesting because in Patrick, Rachel, and Kirk, we have very different backgrounds. And I'll just give you some back background on them. Um, Patrick, you did your postdoc research on automatic facial expression recognition. Kirk, you have a PhD in geography. You are a cartographer. And Rachel, you track tumors and cancer-related mutations, which is just absolutely incredible work. Um, and I'm wondering if that, you know, that background outside of sports informs, inspires, gives you a different perspective that helps with the work you're doing and helps create breakthroughs. I'm wondering if you can talk to how that, your diverse backgrounds influence your work. Yeah, I think they're the same thing. And so uh, I worked in facial expression recognition, so pain, depression, facial paralysis. Um, we just want to measure human behavior. And so once upon a time, you look at all the stuff in behavioral economics, you do it in a lab. And so now we have the tools to collect data and measure human behavior in the wild. And so sports is great for that. You need 10,000, 20,000 hours and you just follow the data. And so my work with faces is that we're just measuring human behavior from a single uh, individual. Sports is just multi-agent. You have people and you have a lot of data. And a lot of the same principles hold. Just complex systems, understanding how um, people interact, but basically using computer vision and machine learning as our thermometer. We just want to analyze decisions and we want to gain data to make better decisions or just check what decisions are made. Cancer not the same, yeah. cancer research not the same. <laughs> cancer research not the same as fastball research. Um, but as a data scientist, it is a really similar skill set, so that's easily transferable. Um, I think also it's frowned upon to start thinking about genomics in sports. Um, I think that really gets into some privacy issues. So We're gonna get there. I'm not, <laughs> not going to be uh, directly transferring those skills, but all the data science is really similar. Yeah, and I think, like I said, you know, cartography is this particular field that is thousands of years old, but the documents that we produce have been sort of the keys to spatial strategy domains for thousands of years. And like in this decade, it's been the logical extension uh, for sports analytics to start thinking and visualizing the spatial data that people like Patrick are collecting and analyzing. Um, and so I think the foundational education in a field like that, uh, or, or in biomechanics or these other tangential fields that are not tangential anymore, um, they're, they're not sort of nice, gratuitous things anymore. They're, they're, the, they're the center of, of the endeavor. Um, so I think that's, that's an important trend, too. So, Chris, a bit of a different perspective. You're someone who has played baseball at all levels, from youth on up to, obviously, major league. How does that background, that wealth of knowledge, influence the type of um, you know, tracking data that you want and the way you think about tracking data? Yeah, you know, I, I um, me in particular, I, I wasn't someone, uh, I was sort of more an average ability type player in the big leagues, you know, not a particularly hard thrower, um, someone who had to try to really look for every uh, advantage and every avenue to try to uh, stay competitive and compete at that level. And um, so, so all of this availability of this, of this new analytics is, is in a powerful way for players to try to, you know, players with kind of average ability uh, to be able to sort of take them to that next level. Um, and a guy like Trevor Bauer uh, is a great example of someone who came into baseball, uh, I guess about maybe six, seven, eight years ago now, and uh, was looked at like a real outlier. You know, people thought this guy was crazy with the way he was, uh, you know, using these, these uh, spin rates and these other things to try to um, hone his pitches and try to think about his craft differently. Uh, and now it's pretty mainstream. Um, and so it's become a natural fit for me uh, post-baseball now to try to um, focus more on these things because while, when you're a player, um, there's sort of a balance between information that can help you and paralysis by analysis. And this is something that, um, you know, uh, I dealt with even in my career um, before a lot of these analytics came in. You know, you're looking at all these numbers and these scouting reports and, um, you know, ultimately, the athlete has to be able to keep it simple for himself, for himself out there or herself. Right. And um, 
you know, what Kirk touched on was the need for, uh, you know, education at a young age and these kinds of skills and the need for, uh, you know, players especially. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in looking at getting players uh, these sort of opportunities to further their education because what's missing is that bridge uh, to communicate with players out there and help them use this information and get the most out of it. And uh, to me, I, I didn't get a chance at the uh, Holy Grail question, but to me the Holy Grail is uh, um, figuring out, as Kirk was saying, how to bring it all together. And how do we, how do we turn this uh, into a comprehensive player monitoring program um, and make sure that we're confident uh, in the accuracy of, of the measurements being taken. Um, that to me is the holy grail, someone who can kind of put it, one company that can put it all together, one team that can put it all together. Yeah, one thing just because a million percent, what Chris just said, I think sports analytics, at least in pro sports, is a communication problem. You know, the AI you know, and, and, and the regression and the modeling is almost the easy part. The most successful organizations have found a way to build the bridge that he's talking about. And that, in this room, remains sort of the, the hardest part and the, and the biggest organizational weakness in, 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 in the analytics field, in my opinion. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, do you have any ideas for solutions to the, I call it data interpretation, I mean, to how you can engage fans or players better, or, um, you know, general managers, coaches, journalists, you know, what can you guys do who, who generate the data to better engage people and, and help them better interpret the data and, for, from the player perspective, not get to the point of paralysis by analysis? Well, this, this will work itself out because, the, you know, the, the younger generation, at least in, in baseball, um, you know, the... Uh, in the minor leagues, teams have a lot of latitude uh, to try, you know, uh, cutting edge wearables, different, different uh, devices. And these players are, at a very young age, getting used to using these, using this data to try to optimize their performance and to try to uh, optimize their recovery. And they're thinking about things like, um, you know, like impact and strain and load on their bodies. Um, for example, you could have one pitcher throwing 95, uh, you know, two pitchers throwing 95, but doing it in very different ways. One, one sustaining, uh, you know, a lot more impact and strain on his body. And we used to know these things anecdotally, and now you can actually start to quantify it. And so this is something that as these young players uh, in college, I was just back at Duke, my, my alma mater, speaking of Zion, uh, a couple weeks ago. Name and uh, Yeah, and um, I got a chance to spend some time with their baseball team, and it's amazing how advanced they are uh, in the 19 years since I graduated. Um, these kids are, they're, they're bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, the way that they train and the way that they're, they've grown up in this digital environment. They've grown up with this, uh, using this sort of visual interaction and this data. So the problem will sort itself out eventually. It's just sort of how do we bridge the gap uh, until these young players kind of get into those positions of instruction. Yeah, and Will I, it sort I itself say, out with a larger public, too? I mean, you know, the journalists, the fans. I mean, this is going to be anyone, but it means for the larger beyond players who aren't growing up with this. I, I think a lot of the leagues are doing a great job of, uh, you know, maybe doing alternative broadcasts for games and integrating some of, this, uh, some of this data in ways that make the game super interesting for fans and, and help them engage on a much deeper level. And... Um, um, so I, I think the, you know, the networks and the, t and the uh, broadcasting is actually doing a pretty good job of, of translating this data into meaningful, enjoyable experiences for fans. Isn't the solution already there? Kids play video games. Yeah. They interact with it. So that's the solution. It's, it's how do we bridge a gap and get it in that form. The way we consume sport now, whether it's media or whether it's an athlete, um, is changing, right? So it's very personal. It's a paradigm shift. We go in OTT. I'm watching on my laptop on my phone. I'm going to consume it myself. I want to ask my own specific questions. So I think to your point, Kirk, you know, we, we have this spatial language. It's very spatial. It's visual. We, that's the language that we have to use. Right. We're kind of fixed the words. You go to YouTube and you put in uh, a query. That's not sufficient for sport. That's not going to articulate it. You have an example. Let's use that. We have this interactive element you know, with an iPad or a video game controller. Because it's complex, we have to interact that way. So I think the solution's there. Mm -hmm. It's just that getting the right language and the interaction and just looking at the consumer, you know, it's personal. So you just can't do it broad. 
And I think a lot of great stuff's happening, um, but I think the solution's there. It's just mapping that, what happens in real world sport to what actually happens in video games, because that is a pathway of understanding and interacting, getting that quick feedback. Yeah, to echo on the video games, um, I think, especially for shooting, where it's a very confined um, problem, um, one of the interesting things will be, can we compare uh, what the kids are doing, what the youth are doing, to how the pros are performing? And um, if we give them a, sh a certain like ranking score on how um, their shots are entering the hoop, can the kids, can they compete with that? Um, and I think that would be a really fun interactive way of engaging both the professional side and the youth side um, in a video game setting. Yeah, I have three nephews who would like something <laughs> like that. Um, I want to get into a, sort of a big topic here and a somewhat controversial topic, and that's data ownership and ethics around tracking data. Um, how do you all think about the issues related to data privacy, especially since some of the advanced tracking methods walk a pretty fine line between you know, performance metrics and healthcare data? Uh, I, I know, Kirk, you have some strong feelings about Well, I just this. think it's terrifying. Um, that's my feeling. Um, and I think it's something we need to get ahead of in this community. Uh, the ethical dimension of sports analytics as we're talking about people's livelihoods, bodies, their heart rates, their blood types, their saliva, their sleep. What are we doing, man? Like, what are we doing? And, you know, there is no line between medical data and sports data anymore. And, it's also and like we need to be protecting our organizations, our analytics groups, but particularly our athletes. Uh, and this is their data. This is data about them that's being collected sometimes without their permission, sometimes with their permission. I think uh, Chris will have great insight on what the, the role of the players' associations are, what types of people in other technological fields we should be consulting, because it's not unique to sports, but these ethical challenges associated with data and uh, human beings are dicey and we're racing into that space whether we like it or not. Yeah, I was going to say, Chris, it's not only, it's all of this private information, but it's also your livelihood too. I mean, this affects everything. It can affect the future of your career. What do you see, you know, the MLBPA potentially doing? Are we looking at every future iteration of a collective bargaining agreement, including privacy, you know, data privacy clauses. Yeah, and it will have to because, uh, as Kirk was saying, these lines have gotten so blurry that, um, you know, I, I sort of used to conceptually think about uh, data as being either gathered externally, you know, from cameras and, uh, you know, radar equipment, yeah. lasers, things like that, uh, versus a little more, uh, you know, I guess invasive or internal type methods, whether it's wearables, um, you know, things measuring heart rate variability, cortisol levels. Um, you know, now you're now you're in my house. Now you're now I'm a little I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable. Uh, you know, especially as as I worry about this information uh, being shared, being used. Uh, uh, you know, for gambling, for for different different uh, reasons. And so, you know, I think the I think the labor unions have I think baseball has handled it well in terms of sort of putting a hold on on uh, just letting it flood in. Uh, uh, you know, unchecked. And currently uh, in baseball, they try to make sure that uh, players have just as much access to the data as teams do. Um, and the labor unions uh, are now building their analytics capability to try to match uh, the leagues and the teams. They, they have to do that to try to give good, solid advice to players. Um, and, you know, supposedly uh, upon request, uh, the player can request the team to delete all the data. The team's not supposed to be able to use this data uh, in contract negotiations, which although since GMs and front offices are privy to all this information, I don't see how they could not use it. Um, and so I think that a lot of the players in the league now are afraid. Um, we're scared of what we don't understand. And um, they're scared of, you know, if my heart beats differently than the next guy, does this mean I'm not going to, you know, get the contract I've worked so hard for? Or, um, but so it's going to help guys and hurt others. I, I personally have had a good experience. I've been open to sort of um, using these analytics to try to, to, try to uh, improve myself and gain an advantage. And I had my second Tommy John surgery in 2008. I missed uh, two years coming back from the surgery. 
And there was no pitchers who had had two that had come back and you know, been able to pitch at a high level. And uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers have always been a pretty forward-thinking organization. And they had a medical director named Stan Conti who um, had really looked close at a lot of video, looked at my biomechanics, and I'd worked very hard on my biomechanics to try to avoid some of the patterns that was causing uh, strain on my arm. And you know, it, it, it led, this advanced analytics led them to uh, take a chance on me and say, hey, we know this guy is, would, we would normally never sign a guy with two Tommy Johns like this, but uh, based on what we're seeing with, these, with this advanced data, uh, we'll take a shot. And so it worked to my benefit. I ended up playing the next two years in LA and, and had a great experience. So, um, yeah, but it's, uh, it's dicey because some of the most useful information is gleaned from these wearables, from things like trying to measure the stress that you feel anecdotally throughout the course of the season and you know you have to adjust, adjust the way you, you prepare. So this is extremely valuable to me as a player. At the same time, um, you know, I worry, you know, about getting the proper protections. Um, Eventually, though, I think it'll, it'll be pretty similar to just getting your blood pressure taken, and I see these things being as part of your medical records that have standard HIPAA-type protections. So, Patrick, we talked a little bit about um, what you're doing with Autostats, and you just recently signed an agreement to be the exclusive Autostats provider for the Orlando Magic with the intent of basically evaluating college players. And I'm curious, just... Ethically, I mean, you, you, this information can essentially determine, potentially determine, a future of some young college player. True, but the data already exists. Yeah. You know, sport is played in a public forum. You know, it's a public disclosure. The video exists. So the data is there. public information. And so it's public information. Um, and so when you get to wearables, that's a different story. That's very personal. But it's a public disclosure. So you could have humans watch it. That's what they do, they watch video, and then they use their gut. As we all know here, that doesn't really work. You know, we want data-driven decisions. And so the ability to digitize this video to help people make better decisions, because they're doing it anyway, we're just doing it in a, a more effective way. Because, yeah, we're just trying to emulate what a human does, but we can just do it at scale. Yeah, I think, I think the real question comes down to feasibility of protection. Um, and like Patrick said and like what Chris said, when it comes to uh, optics, regardless of how much you want to protect that, it's really hard <coughs> to protect that data because, you know, within a couple of years, anyone coming in with a smartphone is just going to be able to record that and get any of that tracking data they want. Um, but when it comes to things like wearables or um, a blood draw or spitting, um, those things, I think, should be protected. But I think the other key thing is not only how it's collected, but where it's collected. And so if it's being collected in a public, in a public format in a game, then it's, it's public, but um, if it's optical. Um, but if it's being collected in a practice setting or something like that, then I think that should be off limits. And that's where the bulk of the data is really gonna be coming from. Do you think we'll have success in, in is, is that feasible? You asked the question, is the feasibility? I mean, but you know, is it realistic for us you know, to draw a line somewhere between you know, the optics and what's collected in practice or what's collected privately and so on and so forth. Is that a, a feasible thing to do in the future? Um, I mean, just inherently, if you... Because everybody wants more and more and more and yeah, more. Yeah, if you're wearing a wearable, then it, the data is going to be flowing through that company. Or if you are sequencing someone's genome, that's going to be flowing through an electronic health system, right? And so it's, there's going to be positions in the, along the pipeline where we can privatize that. And so whether or not we do it, that's a choice. But it, I think it is feasible. The optics, I don't think it's feasible. These are tough questions that we were talking, you know, in her cancer research, you need access to data to make, make these breakthroughs, to make these discoveries. Uh, and, and so this is, uh, there's going to be this tension between wanting to make progress you know, uh, as a society and, and solve some of these big problems and protecting people's, uh, you know, privacy on the other hand. And, and this is just such an interesting thing that we're just going to have to sort of take it one step at a time and deal with it one, one, one issue at a time, one technology at a time, the way we have it. <coughs> I'm just curious, Chris, how worried, you know, you, you, you saw the benefit with, you know, a team saying, ah, we see what he's doing and we'll, we'll take a chance on him. But how worried are you about potentially players in the minor leagues or players who don't get the same benefit of the doubt and, and their injury history in that video is used against them? I think, uh, you know, 
I don't think, and I'm a player and I sh I'm skeptical of ownership's intentions all the time, but um, it's just natural, it's just in innate. But, uh, you know, I don't think that the teams are actively sort of sifting through this data and saying, how can I use this to pay, to pay X player less? You know, I think that, um, you know, they're certainly looking for a competitive advantage, which means um, trying to uh, maximize performance and reduce injury time. You know, the teams, teams spend a lot of money on uh, players on the DL, on injured players. Um, and so I think certainly from a, from a health and performance standpoint, the interests are aligned in a lot of ways in this stuff. Um, and I think that the, um, you know, the players just need to sort of build up their uh, analytics capabilities because uh, I think the data can also be used to, to you know, show positives on the player side as well. So I, I worry about this data being used against players, but at the same time, um, the benefits that they're going to derive from it uh, in terms of, you know, uh, like what I'm doing with Proteus, trying to flag injuries before they happen and trying to... Um, you know, just personalized training and optimized training. Um, I think the benefits kind of outweigh a lot of that. And I would just say there's some ugly precedents in pro basketball that teams don't always do the right thing with the player health data. Um, and, you know, you shouldn't trust ownership. You know, they haven't earned it. <laughs> they haven't earned it in a lot of cases. And, and like I said, we're racing headlong into this complex idea. And, you know, we talk more about pro sports in here than we probably should. Sports is 99.9% .9 amateur. Um, it's AAU games, it's college basketball. Um, these things are gonna infiltrate those domains as well. And there aren't collective bargaining agreements. Mm -hmm. And while I think it's a great point that Chris makes, like, yeah, the players associations need to wake up to analytics and deal with these issues in particular. Um, what about the NCAA? Uh, what about other youth sports organizations as these things continue to broaden out to the base of the pyramid of the sport? These are really important questions. Um, and I'm sort of pessimistic, given what I'm seeing now, that we're going to do the right thing at the right time, unless somebody or something sort of starts to change really quickly. But on the flip side there, Kirk, it's exciting. You know, why should all the analysis be done for pros? You know, why can't high school kids get that type of analysis? You know, you have no way you can get that feedback. Your iPhone should be a measurement tool. Why can't I do that? Why can't I compare myself to Ronaldo? Why can't I compare myself to Zion? Why can't I compare myself to Michael Jordan? Yeah, but Mark Zuckerberg compare yourself to Zion. I mean, that's the problem. Is like, where does the data go after your iPhone collects it? Where well, that's another data? conversation. Well, that's you know, beyond that. But Those you look the at the positives. So, uh, if you look at Facebook, we get a lot. We get that for free. Okay, people locked in. They get all this stuff for free, and they get the data. You can opt out. You don't have to be on there. Right. right. You can use this technology. You don't have to opt in. But you know. I, I, I don't think you can opt out of tracking data in terms of optical tracking data. You know, if even at like a high school level, all of our games are being video recorded, right? And so all of our data can be used in something like AutoStats, right? And, and I think that's okay. But if someone's putting Oh, sorry. Someone's putting uh, like a wearable on a high school player. I think that is crossing, and then trying to use that data against them or in any way. I think that's crossing a line. Yeah, and that's my point. My last point is I think Patrick's work here is marvelous, um, but it's showing me that you don't need a wearable to track basketball players. That's great. We now know their pose and where they are on the court and whether the shot went in just with the video. Video is data. That's the thesis. Great. But in five years when we're sitting here now, he's got a project where we're looking at heart rate or we're looking at something else just from the video camera somehow. What do we do then? What, how do we protect our, our athletes then? And I worry about as it trickles down what pressure younger athletes, particularly athletes who might be competing for a college scholarship or competing for some selective sports program, what pressure they feel to opt in to these tracking programs because this is their way to advance through the rungs, the development rungs in the United States or whatever country they're in. So I think that, I don't know if that, that's a concern as well. Um, shift gears a little bit looking at the fan experience. Um, we mentioned heart rate tracking and, and stuff like that. Um, there was a case in Australian rules football where they did use a wearable. It's a wearable case. Um, and it was a, a high pressure kick and they put the kicker's heart rate on a jumbotron. Um, this was one way of using athlete tracking data. Um, I'll start with Chris. Can you imagine 
Um, I don't think they would have let me. I don't think they would have let me pitch. I was going to say having a full, having <laughs> yeah. a full count, you know, and then having your heart rate, you know, put up yeah. on the jumbotron or something like yeah. that in a stadium. I mean, I can I can remember uh, the first time I ever pitched in the playoffs was in 2013 with LA, and um, when I came into that game, I could I could literally see my heart beating through my uniform. You know, it was just pounding, and I could I could just literally see it doing that. And um, so we don't need a wearable for you. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't even need a wearable. Yeah, you could have just seen that. So um, you know, and I ended up you know pitching great, having a great game. Um, you know, uh, but biometrically, I probably would have been all over the map. Um, and I don't know, I just, uh, I can see how that would be really interesting for the fans, you know, to see Adam Vinatieri before he goes up to kick that field goal, you know, what's just like totally cool as ice, or is he like, you know, freaking out inside? Um, uh, but I, I don't see us getting to uh, a point in any of the four major U.S. sports um, where that kind of stuff is, is uh, available to the broadcast. However, I do see how it's extremely useful in measuring uh, the load and the strain on an athlete's body. Um, and so as long as we can, you know, as long as we can safeguard that data and we can, we can sort of use it and have equal access to it and have control over it and, um, um, you know, it's, it's too valuable not to use. Other thoughts on will we see this or won't we see something similar? Maybe the Australian would like to. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, probably the Australian stole something, so that's why his heartbeat was up. You know, so he, but uh, no, I, I think there's that fine line. I think we'll find it here in the States um, where you have regulation coming in. You don't, you know, to your point, Kirk, you know, with Facebook, you, you don't want them to have a complete map of who you are. However, there are other places like China where they have all the data that you have. Um, they can do better predictions. Talking to Rachel beforehand, you know, that's very useful for cancer research. You know, healthcare analytics is not going to be effective here because we haven't got a full footprint. You know, when you do healthcare analytics, you hear IBM Watson, you know, hey, we're going to predict all these things. But you haven't got enough data. You know, you go to the doctor every month. You know, what you need to do is track everyone every second of the day. Um, and that's that trade-off. So I think here in the States, you, you have the player unions. Regulation's going to come in. The big tech companies, regulation's going to come in where you, each company is not going to be able to have all the data to map your personality, map what you're going to do, that minority report, I'm going to predict what you're going to do. I think regulation is going to come in here so you stop these big banks, the new banks, with the data banks, from mapping that out. But you're going to lose a competitive advantage. We have other countries where they don't have regulation. What happens if they have that competitive advantage, they do better prediction. You know, where, where the product's not as good. Right. So the economics, you know, players get paid. Um, you know, so there's that kind of balancing act, and it kind of, sports is a really good microcosm of what's happening, but it's, it's AI is just works really well now, and it's a function of data. Whoever has most data wins. China's really good at it, because they have a full, um, full map of, of people, and they can predict. And yeah. so here in the States, I think it will happen naturally, it will regulate, but then we'll fall behind other countries. So, um, yeah, so it's that juggling act. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I don't have a lot of faith that the regulation in our country in general when it comes to these data ethics issues has been um, particularly keeping pace with the, the larger organizations that are, that are um, collecting the data. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. And I would say, you know, with these great opportunities comes great responsibility. I think, you know, the vendors have a responsibility, whether it's NOAA or stats or whatever to, to really understand everything they're measuring about these human beings and, and where it's going and who it, what what's in there and what what is your guys's role in this whole thing too I mean I think it's an interesting question well I think you have GDPR coming in Europe so you have to be very careful uh, what we talked about before where's that line you know yeah. I think wearables is definitely there you're drawing blood um, but I think what you need to do is self-regulate otherwise you will be regulated so it's just being a good citizen of data and, yeah. and having that thought leadership. Um, but ultimately, it's just uh, maximizing the value of the data that we have. You know, there's lots of cool stuff. We can really drill down to the negatives, but there's so much cool stuff that we can do. We can answer these questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jordan versus LeBron. That's cool. Well, Chris, you know, against another pitcher. That's awesome. You know, we can't do that beforehand. We have the opportunity to do that. So I think as a, a community here, 
we're going to, we're just scratching the surface, you know, we have this data, it's really just focused on pros, it's kind of limited in five years, let's have 40, 50 years worth of that data. Then we can have these good conversations about who's the best player and really drill down to context. That's really exciting. So for all this kind of negative, um, it's not negative, these are the discussions that we have to have because people's livelihoods are at stake. You know, some people making decisions that probably we, we can't trust, but there's all this cool stuff as well. And um, I don't think you need to limit innovation. I think you just really focus and then trust people are gonna make good decisions. Yeah, and yeah. the market will decide, you know. And the, the flip side, like you said, is the, the, uh, the products that we're going to see on the field now that we are seeing are so much, uh, they're so much better. The, the athletes themselves you can think about as individual innovation labs. And you think about how innovation works, it's these rapid iterations, these sprints where you get feedback and you, you, know, you keep iterating. And players now, I was having a conversation with um, uh, Zach Grinke uh, last week, and he was talking about how we were having a conversation about how you'd be throwing a, a slider in your bullpen or a certain pitch in your, in your practice session between games. Uh, maybe it wasn't working and you'd throw one good one or maybe whatever, whatever it is. The pitching coach tells you, oh, your hand's not on top of the ball. You know? And it's, it's all feel. You're all going off feel of making these adjustments. Well, now I can go back and remember that fourth pitch that I threw that had you know, exceptional movement that did just what I want to do. And I can look at it almost in real time and say, bring that up and I can see exactly where my hand position is on the ball. I can see exactly what kind of uh, spin rate it's got, all these other metrics, what it's doing as it's going across the plate, uh, and then uh, get that instant feedback and just rapidly sort of iterate. And so uh, the people in the game now are, are all saying the same thing. It's exciting sort of how fast you're able to develop and make these improvements uh, because people are sort of visual learners and they can interact uh, with this data in a way that sort of just helps them learn so much faster than before. One last question before we head to audience questions. Um, don't think you can talk about sports today in this context without talking about the legalization of sports gambling. How do you see that impacting the tracking data space or vice versa, tracking data impacting um, legalized sports gambling? Rachel. I, I think it's an exciting opportunity for tracking data because not only will it be useful in the gambling, which is a whole other thing, but um, I think it can play an integral role in protecting the integrity of the game. And um, I think that's vital as we go into a new um, kind of generation of players that um, will have all these new pressures on them, um, especially at younger levels too. Um, and so to be able to use tracking data in order to kind of hold people accountable or have a little bit better prediction of whether or not people are playing with integrity, um, that can be a really useful thing. I think that's a really great point. I think uh, in terms of gambling, you know, prediction. So we have more data, we're going to do better prediction. Okay. So that's the value there. But ultimately, um, you, with this data, you can start to create markets. Okay. So prediction market, a predictive market's the best predictor that you're going to have. You have millions of people betting on something, that's the best predictor. But for player props, specific things, um, you're not going to have enough people betting on that to create a predictive market. So here you can have empirical evidence. It's kind of like a credit bureau. So you're going to have realms of uh, possibilities or, or realms of um, what is expected. And if people are outside that, you can flag that. And so to Rachel's point, I think that's excellent. I think we can use that to um, maintain the integrity of the game. So you're flagging anomalous behavior. Um, so I, I think there's great promise there. Right, I'm going to turn to some audience questions. Um, I think this one is for you, Kirk. Um, as these questions get more complex and interdisciplinary, will small market teams be further disadvantaged? I say for you because you worked for the Spurs small market team. Eighth largest city in America, small market. Small yeah. market, though. It is a small market. Uh, as a geographer, I just have to poke on that a little bit. Point taken. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean... I think what's happening with sports analytics at the team level is really interesting because even the most aggressive teams in the space are not equipped to deal with what's coming at them. The stuff that Patrick is throwing at them this year, um, that stuff that Rachel and, and her company has thrown at us for the last few years, it's, we're drowning in a sea of data and it's different kinds of data and that requires different forms of expertise at very high levels, at PhD levels, to extract the intelligence from. Um, and it's really interesting because the budgets are not allotted 
enough, there's not enough resources to solve the problems at the rate they need to be solved. Um, I think if baseball is a good example, you are seeing the richer teams get these competitive advantages via analytics right now. Um, but some of the wet, richer teams are not there. It's not just about how big your market is or how wealthy your owner is. Um, it's not that simple. And indeed, in the NBA, some of the smaller market teams have been the most innovative because they need to be. Um, so I think it's a blend of like, you know, which organizations put value on this stuff and which are more strategic about bringing the right people together. Um, but the groups are gonna keep getting more and more large and more and more complex and more and more hyper-educated because the problems are too. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is for Patrick. Uh, what new insights has stats unlocked with, it says Autobot data, but I think they mean auto stats data, unless there's an Autobot data that I'm so unaware of. So someone knows it's a Transformers. Yeah, something going on. Next it's, year, it's, yeah. But yeah, what, what's, what new insights have... Uh, so we've done some work. So a couple of years ago, we presented a paper just looking at body pose and seeing like the very micro changes of the shots of Steph Curry and, and Clay Thompson. And so currently we're in the midst of just generating all this new data in college. And so I'm sure next year we'll have some really cool insights. Um, but to that end, we have all this soccer data. We have 12,000 games worth of tracking data in soccer. And it's kind of breaking down teams and, and looking at key patterns there. So... What we've been able to do, like Leicester City, I use Leicester City example. You know, people think Leicester City won the Premier League because of Jamie Vardy and Ray Admirez. That's not the case. Uh, they won because of Casper Schmeichel, the goalkeeper, and also N'Golo Kante. He intercepted most of the balls. And so once upon a time, you couldn't measure those things. Yeah. Okay, we actually can go down and drill down on every decision made and actually focus in on what counts. And so just using auto stats, generating tracking data enables us to analyze every decision. So i show an example for, for soccer there, but for college, we'll, we'll do the same. Looking at the mismatch between NCAA and the, and the pros, just seeing what characteristics kind of um, meld there. So that's just a couple of examples that we had. And I think this could be opened up to everyone. It's directed to stats, but it's, it's a question of how does stats think about maintaining competitive advantage with so many sports analytics startups emerging? But I'm just curious, how do you, how does everyone stay on the cutting edge, whether you're a company or working for a company or you're doing analysis for a broadcast or you're a player, how do you get your, make sure you are on the cutting edge of what's happening in this space? Well, I'll get started. Like the stats we, we have, the most data. Mm -hmm. And so to do AI, you need data. So if you're a startup, um, it's very tough unless you have data. And so machine learning, machine learning is somewhat commoditized, use TensorFlow, all that stuff's there. You just need the data. The, the real value is the data. And so for a startup, uh, it's tricky if you haven't got that. I know, Noah, you have a lot of data, you collected it, but if you haven't mm -hmm. got that, it, it, it's, it's really tricky. Yeah. yeah. No, I, th I think it's Go the ahead. same. I think it's also, it's a data question. Um, and being a trusted partner with that data and like having the integrity of that people will like give you that data and trust you to protect it on their behalf. Do you I think, think data being, will uh, we get harder to collect at all in the future or easier? I mean, we've talked about how this is becoming, you know, but I mean, is it going to, you're just going to... Oh, I think it will get easier, easier to collect. Um, I, I mean, Autostats is a, great, <laughs> is a great example of that. It's getting easier and easier. Um, so then it comes down to how can you protect the data that you have? Mm -hmm. um, and whether you're going to do that through like intellectual property or um, that's where through, I was like, going. Yes, if it's easy for everybody, then how do you protect what you have? Yeah. yeah. Yes. What was that question again? I, I had something for it. Oh, it was <laughs> about how do you stay at the cutting edge of what you're doing? Whether you're a player, yeah, or, you yeah. know, the cut, how do you stay at the yeah. cutting edge in this so, space? So you have to you have to make the insights uh, understandable and actionable, right, for the athletes mm -hmm. and the teams, and that's. Um, um, that's kind of how you have to stay connected to what their needs are, and you have to sort of help them crunch the data because um, you know, the, the, that's the biggest challenge for teams is to sift through and find things that are actually actionable that maybe are predictive or, or um, you know, are signaling of, of injuries about to happen. So, and then, like I said, gamification of these technologies the, that the athletes have to enjoy uh, you know, interacting with them. It has to be familiar, understandable, uh, fashionable. I mean, you know, guys, you know, that like to be comfortable, all that stuff. So uh, all of those things go into trying to stay at the cutting edge, um, I think, uh, in a, in a space, space that's going to be increasingly crowded. Kirk, your thoughts? 
Uh, I would echo everything that Chris just said and just add it's still about research and it's about clean research questions. Going in and tell me, don't tell, tell me that I'm a bad shooter, tell me why I'm a bad shooter. Uh, don't just tell me that I'm an inefficient sort of runner or shooter physically, tell me why. But what are, what are the, as teams and leagues and researchers, it's what can we, what questions can we answer now that we couldn't answer five years ago and identifying which of those are most important to the sport, that's gonna to continue to drive the innovation. Yeah, and, and I think also um, echoing that, it's providing enough value that people are going to want to trust you with their data, right? And if you're not providing that value for them, then they're not gonna trust you with the data and then you're gonna have nothing to work with. So it's kind of a balancing act. So thank you, oh, with that we're up time-wise, but I wanna thank our panelists, Chris, Kirk, Rachel, Patrick, and I expect them to tell us how we'll gain more value in the future and why. Good. Thank you, and also thanks to our fearless student lead, Frank. <laughs>